drafts. You see the candies being displayed in the store. It began as an ice cream company. It always featured candy, but their innovation in terms of serving women's food or what was thought of as women's food was to offer lighter entrees along with elaborate desserts. Then, and I'm afraid now, the stereotype of what women like in terms of culinary choices is light entrees and elaborate desserts. And, and I'm not saying anything about this being true, but I will say that my experience at Schraft's was with my grandmother. My grandmother was a woman who had not worked most of her life, who played canasta and mahjong, who knitted, who uh, loved Broadway matinees, uh, daytime soap opera TVs and quiz, quiz shows. Uh, and my mother never would go to Shrafts. My mother never would have taken me there because my mother thought of herself, well, justifiably, she was a PhD, she was a professional woman, she didn't have time for. The stereotype of Shrafts was uh, uh, somebody like my grandmother. And my grandmother would order cottage cheese and fruit. That would be her entree. Cottage cheese was thought of as light. And then she'd order a banana split for dessert or a chocolate sundae. So that kind of balancing was uh, typical or maybe let's say archetypal uh, of what women were, uh, were supposed to like. Schraps is also a pioneer in the middle class level. So we've seen Delmonico's and Antoine's, which were fancy restaurants. Uh, at the lower end would be so-called uh, luncheonettes or uh, roadside truck stops or the equivalent, uh, working men's cafes. Uh, the middle class place is some place that's nice but not expensive or nice but not pretentious. And the nice means a sort of predictable. So Schraff's was a, a gracious, pleasant, calming. This one was on Madison Avenue. This is a late photograph. You see the men's grill on the right below the sign. Uh, that's an attempt to attract men because by the 1970s, this uh, image of women like my grandmother was passe, or at least not sufficiently alive enough to run a business on. And so desperately, Schraff's tried to attract men. This one, I think, had a zebra striped furnished bar, actually. They started serving alcoholic drinks, but this didn't succeed. Schraff's went out of business uh, in the 1980s, uh, a victim to social changes for women, but it was a pioneer in the middle-class dining level uh, that really the greatest exemplar of the early 20th century in terms of numbers of restaurants was Howard Johnson's. Howard Johnson's, which many of us will remember uh, from childhood or later, was uh, by the 1960s the largest, uh, served more people in the United States than any other institution except the US Army. It had almost a thousand branches coast to coast. Uh, it had been created in Massachusetts uh, around the First World War. Uh, it was pioneering in several ways. One was the predictability I mentioned before. You knew what you were going to get at Howard Johnson's. You knew what would be on the menu. You knew the level of service. It also pioneered franchising. So franchising is where the company partners with a franchisee to open restaurants and it leverages the brand name to open many more restaurants because the franchise than it could by itself because the franchisee bears a substantial part uh, uh, of the expense. So this is one in New, New London, Connecticut, uh, New England uh, and the Mid-Atlantic had the densest population of Howard Johnson's. The old model uh, of a Howard Johnson's was a kind of neo-colonial look. So this is what you would have seen uh, predominating before the First World War. The colors were important. Howard Deering Johnson, the founder, wanted to situate his restaurants in such a way, topographically and recognizably, that a motorist going 60 miles an hour would have enough time not just to break and park but to decide to stop. So you need to sort of have a couple minutes, uh, 
Oh, there's a Howard Johnson's. Are you hungry? Uh, yes, daddy, I'm, I want to get out of the car or uh, oh, yay, or something to that effect. And then they could pull in without uh, screeching of brakes. And notice they feature their ice cream first, 28 flavors, grill uh, fried clams. So fried clams was an innovation of Howard Deering Johnson and really a stroke of genius because they're not obvious and they're not easy. Not obvious because the only place that fried clams existed really as a common dish were New England and not all of New England, but really Cape Cod and uh, the main coast and places like that that were really uh, where the clams could be dug up. How do you get clams to feature at restaurants coast to coast. And you know, or this uh, 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 is in Fredericksburg, Virginia. So already somewhat inland, but you know, what if you were in uh, Omaha, Nebraska? Uh, yet people who grew up in Omaha or in the Midwest uh, remember fried clams with the same affection as people who grew up in uh, New England. The other thing is fried clams are not like burgers. They're, they're, you know, they're not an obvious meaty kind of dish. They're if you think about it, they're kind of funny. I mean, they're peculiar. They're chewy. Uh, they come from a uh, from. I mean, they come from a clam. What can I say? They were beloved because they were salty, they were sweet, uh, and they were crisp and fried. And if there's anything that Americans like, it's these three things. If I had to summarize American tastes, and if you could combine them all in one dish. Uh, as is the case with fried clams, all the better. The second incarnation of the architectural style of Howard Johnson's is this um, post-war style with the uh, heavily gabled roof. Again, <clears throat> in the orange and blue colors so that you would immediately recognize it, but you'd also certainly recognize it by the shape. And this one is attached to a motor lodge. By the uh, 1950s, Howard Johnson had... Uh, leveraged their brand to uh, motor lodges, to motels. We were very careful not to call them motels, but that's what they were. And, and these still exist. There is only one Howard Johnson's restaurant that is still in operation, and that's in upstate New York. But there are still a fair number of Howard Johnson motels. This is a Howard Johnson menu from the war. Uh, Second World War from 1944 in Rochester, <clears throat> New York. And you can see the old style neo-colonial Howard Johnson and they're using the steeple for the V for victory. 